The Walleye Creek Valley is inner southwest Sydney's environmental gem, but it might have been a motorway. Its 50 hectares of bushland and open space stretches for four and a half kilometres from Tempe to Bexley North, preserving an irreplaceable remnant of the pre-European landscape. It's a tranquil haven in a busy city and a vital wildlife refuge and migration corridor. For 40 years, a struggle over Sydney's future has been fought out here. It's been a complex battle between freeways and public transport, between open space and overdevelopment, between urban sprawl and consolidation, between high carbon and sustainable futures. And I was there for most of it. Well, this is the summit of Nanigo Hill on the Earlwood side of the Walleye Valley. In the original plan, the M5 motorway was going to come straight down the valley on the surface towards us and it would have taken off half of this hill. Of course, eventually, after the longest conservation fight in Sydney's history, the road went in a tunnel underground and avoided most of the valley. But even now, with the threat of West Connex, the fight can't be said to be over. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin at the beginning. In the early years of last century, when the Walleye Creek Valley was a bucolic semi-rural landscape on what was then the outer southwestern fringe of Sydney, the freeway paradigm was just coming into being in far off Europe. And it all began with this bloke. Was the helmet too small for his head? Or was his head too big for the helmet? Whatever. He built the first freeway, or autostrada, as they say in Italy. There were two whole lanes, count them, two, and three-dimensional advertising for Fiat. Didn't really matter that there were only two lanes, because there were only two cars. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, Henry Ford was working on a solution to that. His idea was a mass-produced car for the masses. That's my dad, by the way, sitting on the bonnet. Mussolini's freeway was an interurban affair. It took a Frenchman to imagine a freeway-based city. The influential modernist architect Le Corbusier dreamed of pulling down great swathes of Paris and substituting something better, 60-storey apartment towers which is pretty much what urban growth New South Wales dreams of doing to much of Sydney today. What's missing in these impressions of Le Corbe's scheme is any obvious form of mass urban transit, because he wanted it banished underground. On the surface, the car was going to be king, and he was indeed influential in the decision to remove trams from the streets of Paris. All the elements of Le Corbe's vision are here. The eight-lane freeway, the parking stations and vast car-friendly plazas, and the airport for private planes. Mind you, with the wind tunnel effects that would have resulted from those towers, landing on it would have been suicidal. Adolf Hitler was a great admirer of Mussolini's autostradas. And after he came to power in 1933, there was no holding him back. His freeways, or autobahns, as they say in Germany, were more than twice as wide as Musso's. Four lanes with a generous shoulder. Just the thing for invading Poland. Hitler too was seduced by the sweeping vision of a people's car-based society. Although clearly he thought that 
Ferdinand Porsche's idea of putting the engine at the back was a bit of a hoot. The Autobahns were a great selling point for Hitler's new Germany, as the travel posters show. In 1940, when the war was going well for him, Hitler commissioned a crack team of road engineers to plan a Europe-wide freeway system. It was designed to support new German military colonies stretching through Poland, Ukraine and Russia. The whole shebang was scheduled for completion in 1975. This rare 1942 photo shows Hitler's freeway planners heading for a community consultation at a Russian town called Stalingrad. The line of horse-drawn carts hints at the problem haunting Hitler's freeway vision. Germany had no oil and had to make petrol from coal very, very expensively. Keep that problem in mind because it's the future the whole world increasingly faces. The Stalingrad consultation didn't go well, and in the result, Hitler's pan-European freeway plan was abandoned. After World War II, the epicentre of the freeway movement shifted to the US of A. In order to clear the way for freeways and encourage car sales, General Motors and others conspired to buy up and close down the extensive and efficient streetcar systems that existed in cities right across the US. It was a conspiracy brilliantly satirised in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. What they got was Le Corbusier's eight-lane motorways, but with horizontal rather than vertical sprawl, plus appalling air pollution. But GM and the car lobby loved it, and so did the construction industry. Notice the lines of polluting diesel buses that replaced the efficient electric rail and tramway systems? It's exactly the sort of solution still favoured by Sydney University's Henshaw Bus Institute. Almost nobody thought through what would happen if every family owned a car and drove it everywhere. But the results came soon enough. The cars started to eat the cities. Did I mention that concrete is a major producer of greenhouse gases? If the Yanks do something dumb, can Australia ever be far behind? In 1948, Sydney got a metropolitan plan for the first time. It was called the County of Cumberland Plan, and it aimed to create a compact city and preserve open space for the future. A broad green belt was supposed to surround the city to the west and southwest to preserve rural lands from urban development. But the real estate interests and the road lobby had other ideas. Post-war, the car culture was exploding and the government was under pressure to replace trams with buses and build roads rather than railways. The opening gambit was the winding down and closure of Sydney's massive high capacity tramway system, which was then one of the largest in the world. Against public opinion, it was replaced by inferior low capacity buses, a move supported by the NRMA and the private bus industry. The last tram ran in 1961. The tracks were ripped up or paved over and the scene was set 
for the urban freeway push that followed. The County of Cumberland plan was a curious document. The planners were trying to reconcile fundamentally irreconcilable claims to the available land in a political environment dominated by the relentless rise of the road lobby. This schematic map from the plan shows a web of green corridors supposedly to be protected for the future, the Wallow Valley prominent among them. It also shows the F5 freeway, or South Western Expressway as it was then known, proceeding straight down the valley. The plan's drafters were well aware of the opposition it would face, saying, the opportunities of securing suitable vacant land to meet the need for open space are so limited and the pressure of conflicting development so intense that action must begin immediately. This unsophisticated contemporary impression shows southern Sydney's proposed expressways as they might have appeared from a plane flying south above the Princes Highway. The Southwestern Expressway heads off to the right to follow the north bank of Walleye Creek. The Southwestern Expressway in the original plan would have entered the Valley Hare at Undercliff. And the Bush Hare is less than 100 metres wide. And so the expressway would have carved out all of this bushland between the houses on the ridge line and the creek down there. And yet, in the plan, Walleye Creek Valley gets special mention. It's described as a delightful wedge of open country, and it's proposed that it be a major part of a belt of open space. Somehow, this was expected to be compatible with it being the route of a roaring, polluting, community-dividing expressway. And the planners, in this poignant caption, appeal for it to be spared the fate of Johnson's Creek. And an ugly fate it was. The planners wrote, Once a pleasant stream and a natural boundary of communities, this waterway now exists only as a stormwater drain. This is Johnson's Creek, where it passes under the Parramatta Road in Annandale. Downstream, decades after the County of Cumberland plan, local government is still struggling to correct the errors of the past. The plan was dumped in 1961, and ironically, the Walleye Creek Valley only survived because it remained a freeway reservation. In part two, we'll see how the community stood up to the road lobby and saved Walleye Creek from being a stormwater drain flanked by eight lanes of concrete.